All right, well, welcome everybody to our OLLI tour of the orchestra presentation today with the Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra. I'm excited to introduce to you guys our principal keyboard, uh, Tim Stevenson. He's going to be presenting multiple different keyboards um, and how they are used uh, within the symphony orchestra because often they're solo instruments or, or chamber music instruments. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Tim and he'll uh, share a little bit more about himself. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Great, thanks so much, Sammy. I'm so happy to be here and thankful to Ali at Indiana State as well as the Terre Haute Symphony uh, for inviting me to do this. It's very exciting. Um, and not every day that I get to brush up on my history of all the <laughs> keyboards and uh, give a presentation. So I'm very happy to see everyone here. Um, I'm currently in the doctoral program at Indiana University finishing up hopefully very soon, um, but doing a lot of freelance work, uh, both teaching and performing. And I did my two uh, undergrad, my undergrad and master's degrees in Florida. So I'm from Tallahassee uh, and then came up here for my doctorate. Uh, one thing that's interesting for me is that my trajectory as a pianist was not um, purely classical. Uh, so I have an interest in a lot of different genres, um, which we'll sort of touch on today because the Terre Haute has its upcoming Hats Off to Broadway uh, series, which I took a part of. And so you'll hear a little sneak peek of that um, at the end of the presentation. So I actually thought maybe it would be nice for us to start with a little bit of music. So I'm going to play a short piece for you by Robert Schumann so we can enjoy the beautiful sounds of the piano. Um, my piano is slightly out of tune, so I'll apologize in advance for that. But here's Robert Schumann's Kinderzainen. <laughs> So I figured that it would be nice to get us in the right mood with a little music. And now we're gonna jump into the keyboards themselves. Um, so one thing that Sammy just mentioned when she was talking about the keyboard instruments is that they're often used uh, for other purposes besides orchestral playing. And so I kind of wanted all of you to keep in mind as we're going through this presentation, why you think the piano isn't a primary orchestral instrument. So just keep that in mind. We're going to revisit that. But as we're going through the development of the instruments, maybe we'll do a little participation and see if anyone has any ideas about why the piano might not be in the orchestra very often. Um, one of the unique aspects of keyboard instruments is that there are so many different types. And there's literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of different iterations of each instrument. Um, and the piano by itself is incredibly complicated. Um, and some of the most well-known composers like Mozart and Beethoven, they played completely different instruments than the one that you see here. Um, so this is sort of our modern grand piano. And I wanted to play for you a, uh, an excerpt of a very famous piece um, that you probably hear on the piano all the time, which is this. <laughs> Mozart's Rondo alla Turca. So the piano you see on this, this slide right here is actually similar to the one that Mozart would have been using. And you can see there's like 10 pedals or something. Uh, he had something called the Janissary piano, which had bells. So if you pushed a, a, one of the pedals, then a bell would ring and uh, something slapping 
the piano as well to make a click sound. Um, so this is just to say that as we're going through the keyboard instruments, I'm going to give you a really, hopefully going to give you a broad idea about the different, different types, but there are so many different variations. So I think we should start by asking, what is a keyboard instrument? And so I think one of the common um, conceptions is that these things, these little buttons that I have to press are sort of like buttons on your computer <laughs> where you push a button and then something happens. Um, what actually is the case is that the keys are actually levers. And so the levers, when you push down the key, operate some sort of mechanism in the instrument that does something. And so this goes all the way back to uh, actually ancient Greece was the first, um, the first time that this sort of appeared. Uh, so it's been around a really long time, but in a very different way. So this video I'm about to show you um, kind of shows you the, what a primitive keyboard style instrument would have looked like. And so here it is. So this is a carillon, which is they exist now, but you can see it's giant levers that are operated with the fists or the whole arm. Uh, and that's actually what our original keyboard sort of the mechanism looked like, the giant levers. And as time went on, the levers got smaller and smaller and smaller so that eventually they could just be operated with your fingers. Um, so one thing that I get asked a lot is, what is a keyboard? <laughs> so pretty much every keyboard looks the same, right? It has white keys, black keys. Um, and throughout history, that keyboard actually changed a lot. So it's based on whatever tuning system is used at the time. So in modern time, pretty much since the 19th, 18th century, we've used the same set of notes. So we have C through C with our, our sharps and our flats in between. Uh, and, but that wasn't always the case. So um, when you're looking at these keyboard instruments, you're seeing the final product of uh, like hundreds of years of development in music. Um, so that's why all of them look the same. And we sort of categorize all the keyboard instruments into one big group because they all have this layout that you see on your screen right now. That being said, this is not the only one we see. So <laughs> at the top, you see something called a Jenko keyboard, which was created in 1882. So even though everything was standard, people always, uh, someone thinks they have a better idea. And so they created this keyboard that I can't even comprehend. It looks sort of like those old calculators where you have to like move the beads across. Um, so this, this layout uh, didn't really see any popularity. Uh, I thought it would be interesting because a piano maker in Japan just released a new keyboard, which I'm gonna show you. By the way, as you um, have questions, if you're joining us on Zoom, you're welcome to add them into the chat. Um, or Michelle, you can type questions from in-person folks in the chat as well, and we'll make sure Tim uh, gets to those. Absolutely. So here's a video of a keyboard that has no black keys. So it's really interesting that even though we have a standardized keyboard, people still are coming up with new ways uh, to make it different and interesting. Um, me one minute. Okay. So when we get to the actual instrument part, so that takes care of the keyboard. That's this part of the instrument. 
what happens over here can vary a lot. So depending on the type of instrument we're talking about, it might be categorized into uh, different instrument types. So the wind instruments, which I'm sure all of you have heard about in the last uh, few weeks of tour of the orchestra, we've got the clarinet, Sammy, <laughs> although all the brass instruments, but we also have a keyboard instrument that is technically a wind one, which is the organ because it uses air to produce sound. Um, same goes for the piano. Uh, there are strings inside of the piano. So we categorize that as a string instrument. Um, and then there's a fancy one we'll talk at the end about at the end, which is called an idiophone, which is when the instrument itself makes the sound. Um, I think Keegan gave a talk about the percussion instrument, so I'm sure he told you a lot about those, so like the triangle and the maracas and those types of things. So whatever the key does, or the, the mechanism does when you push down the key, that determines what type of instrument it is. So we're going to start with the oldest one that we know of in the keyboard family, which is the organ. So we've got some lovely pictures of the organ. Um, some features uh, of the organ, it's pre-15th century that it was developed. Um, that was the one where it started with the levers that we saw at the beginning. Um, and the way it's operated uh, is that there's actually a keyboard. We call it a manual, keyboard manual um, for the hands. And there's also a keyboard manual for the feet. So the picture at the bottom right, you can see that there are at the bottom some giant, really long keys, and that's for the um, organist to operate the pedals. Each of these keys is connected to pipes, and the pipes go in order of the scale system that's being used. So modern day, it's the same one that all the instruments use uh, that we saw at the very beginning. Um, but the pipes, you'll see it's very beautiful because they usually go in, in succession where they're they get higher and higher and then lower and lower it's because the, the longer the pipe, the deeper or the lower the sound is. So each note gets a different size pipe. So when you press the key on an organ, there is a valve that gets re basically releases the air so that it can travel through the pipe and it makes a beautiful sound. Um, this funny picture on the left shows sort of a primitive organ, and this poor guy on the left is pumping the air as the person on the right is playing the keyboard. Um, so at, at the very beginning, there had to be two different mechanisms. One was actually a foot pedal that you would pump so that the air was going, and then the, the um, keys are releasing that air into the pipes. Nowadays, it's all electric. You just flip a switch, and then the air is blowing in. Uh, as you can see from this bottom right picture, the organ can get very complicated. There's, there's the pedals at the bottom, um, and then there's little, it looks like little levers, little balls on the side. Um, and those are called stops. So each pipe um, has a bunch of different options. You can add pipes to it, make it sound like a reed instrument or a string. Um, and a lot of times these stops will be labeled. And so like, here's your brass pipe. So it sounds like brass and here's your clarinet pipe. <laughs> it sounds like clarinet. Um, so as things developed, the organ got bigger, more complicated. Um, and so we're gonna listen to a little bit of some famous organ excerpts. This is possibly, I don't wanna sound like I know everything, but maybe the most famous. <laughs> so let's listen to that.
that's a nice ending. Perfect, uh, <laughs> beautiful chord. Um, so the, the organ was um, the primary, actually the only keyboard instrument for a very long time, for hundreds of years. And you may have already gathered this, but, and you could probably guess, the organ was often built at church, right? So it was primarily used as a sacred instrument. And originally to kind of help out the choirs. Um, so in these smaller uh, rural cities in Germany or <laughs> wherever in Europe, the choirs kind of needed some help. <laughs> and if you've been to church choir, I played for a church choir for many years. I had to help my choir out too, so there's no shame. Um, the, the organ uh, had that uh, purpose, but then really when Bach came into the scene, that's uh, the 17th century, uh, he started uh, writing pieces that were really complex, that were serving this whatever service he was playing for. Um, so a lot of the organ repertoire is uh, preludes, which would be a prelude before the service begins, and then goes through um, whatever the traditions of that service are. So if it's a mass, there's the Kyrie and the, I have to brush up on my mass knowledge. That's the only one that's coming to mind, but there's a bunch of them. And so the organ repertoire will actually follow that uh, service. And so its primary use was that. In the symphonic setting, the organ is rare, very rarely used. Um, and that kind of makes sense because symphonies don't usually play in church, <laughs> right? So there's not a lot of uh, modern, modern day, there's um, organs that are built into theaters or auditoriums. Um, but for the most part, uh, when these composers were writing, that wasn't the case. Um, so here is one famous example. Um, Saint-Saëns wrote an organ symphony, um, which is not a concerto. So if you know your repertoire very well, um, the concerto is when the, um, there's a featured soloist who basically uh, is, is the spotlights on them. They're playing the most interesting parts and it's sort of virtuosic. This is supposedly um, supposed to meld the organ with the symphony orchestra. And so here's a little excerpt from the fourth movement. So you can see the organ matches the orchestra in terms of sound, in terms of volume. It's pretty much equal. So that one person <laughs> who's sitting at that keyboard can take on all 80 of those other people sitting in front of them. Um, so that might be a good reason why the organ's not always featured in orchestral music. Um, Sammy, correct me if I'm wrong. We're, the organ symphony is on a program soon. Is that right? Well, it was, uh, okay. it was last year. Um, okay, that was yeah. our missing COVID year. We didn't reprogram it for this season, but surely in a future season. Um, it was supposed to be on our May 2020 concert. Right. And COVID took that away from us. <laughs> so well, hopefully soon, hopefully yeah. soon. I'm sure in a future season, we will include this on our programming. Yeah, great. Um, so the organ is our original keyboard. And as we move forward in time, uh, we find that a stringed instrument appears, the harpsichord. Um, the harpsichord around the 15th century uh, came into being because uh, there were keyboard virtuosos like Bach, uh, people who wrote for those instruments, who were looking for a way to have a more convenient instrument. Uh, the organs were only available in church settings. And the harpsichord uh, provided a small version of that keyboard instrument uh, in order to um, in order to be portable to be brought to different ensembles. Um, so harpsichord is one of the first of these. It's made entirely of wood, 
uh, except, of course, the strings. Um, there's multiple strings for each note, um, which gives it some resonance and some tone quality. And when you look at the harpsichord itself, we're starting to get towards uh, what we know of as the piano, right? It sort of looks like a piano, but much smaller version. Um, what's interesting at the top right, it's a kind of complicated <laughs> diagram of what happens. So I'm going to try to explain in the uh, simplest terms, which is at the uh, bottom left, you have the key. And so that would be equivalent to this key on the piano. And when you push the key down, there's a quill or a hook that plucks the string when you push the key down. Um, and so it makes this really direct sound, which kind of pierces through. Um, so that the instrument itself, the harpsichord, was often used to support these string instruments, which don't have that direct kind of ping quality. Um, another, I think, uh, reason why these instruments came into being is that the music of the time in the 15th, 16th century, um, and especially towards the 17th and uh, 18th century, was gravitating away from the church. And so before that, all music was really written for um, sacred means. And at this point, now we have royalty, the courts that are ho hoping to, um, I guess, make music to glorify themselves, but they would hire these musicians in their courts. And so now we have an instrument that actually can be put into the court, um, which is this harpsichord. On the left, you can see there are two different keyboards. There is one on the bottom, one on the top, and they look really similar. And the keys are switched, right? The, the black keys are white and the white keys are black. This was very common um, at the time. They were basically interchangeable as long as one was one color and one was the other. Um, but the two, the two keyboards, which we call manuals from the organ, actually control different strings. So the top one plays on, plucks only one string, so it's softer, whereas the bottom one will pluck multiple strings so that it's has a big, more full sound. Um, the range of the piano, so the word range kind of refers to how many keys are on uh, the instrument. At the most, at the height of its existence, the harpsichord had five octaves. And so to put that into perspective, this keyboard, this piano in front of me, which is the standard one, um, has almost eight. It has about seven and a half. Um, so that's a significant amount in terms of music. That's like chopping off the whole top half and the whole bottom half of the piano. Um, so let's listen to a little bit of the harpsichord to get it in our ears. Um, this piece on the left, and om I would say everything by Bach uh, was intended, with few exceptions, was intended for this instrument or the organ. Um, so when you hear someone playing Bach on the piano, that's actually not the instrument that that Bach was intending it to be played on. So here is a little excerpt. I'm sure some people recognize this. Uh, it's very famous, it was used in a lot of commercials, <laughs> um, but uh, played very often on the piano. And so you can tell from listening, you can hear that pluck of the string. It's almost like uh, what you would think of as a guitar, um, where you, you hear that plucked string. So it's very direct. Um, a lot of times the harpsichord, uh, so there's basically two paths that composers went once this instrument came into being. Um, for Bach and his contemporaries, as well as the future Bachs, as maybe you know, there's lots of them. Um, they went this route of uh, virtuosic um, 
compositions for a keyboard instrument. So pieces like a toccata, which means to touch, are meant to um, show off all the things that you can do on this brand new fancy harpsichord. Uh, so lots of piano, or sorry, lots of keyboard repertoire from that time, which is the Baroque period, uh, is really flashy. Um, on the other side of that, uh, which is sort of the more practical side, the harpsichord was used as an accompanimental instrument. So it just played, it basically served as a backup to whatever the featured instruments are. And that's where we get the harpsichord in an orchestral setting. Uh, so very often when you hear Baroque music, um, you will hear a harpsichord in there. And so the Handel's Messiah, I'm sure lots of people have gone to hear Messiah that has an entire um, harpsichord part that's basically just the the um, the chords of of the piece as the strings are playing. Um, here's another famous one, which is Vivaldi's Spring, and you'll see that they have the harpsichord. So you can see from that video that they have the harpsichord position straight in the middle of the group. And um, a lot of modern orchestras will do this as well. Um, and basically the harpsichord is grounding the rest of the ensemble. So you can really pick out that harpsichord sound that has that, those pingy notes. Um, and that's sort of the, the harpsichordist would often when needed act as the conductor as well. Um, so sitting at the harpsichord, playing the parts to keep the group together and also conducting them uh, as they're going. So for those um, composers that were writing virtuosic music for this instrument, for the harpsichord, uh, the, the sound of the instrument is very soft and small. It was never enough for them. And so there was a lot of uh, development going on. Uh, throughout, basically after Bach, we're in Mozart time now. So this is uh, early 18th century, mid 18th century. Um, the harpsichord just didn't give them the sound they wanted. And that's where we finally come to this instrument that we have now. Sorry about that. Okay, the piano. Um, so one of the big limitations of the harpsichord is that because the, the strings are plucked, the harpsichord can only make one volume. So there's only one dynamic um, because everything is plucked in the same way. No matter how, how hard you push the key down or how soft it plucks in the same way. Um, so that was one big limitation uh, that was resolved when the piano was invented. Um, so around the mid 18th century, um, the European composers, they were, like I said, all keyboardists. And so there was a ton of music written for harpsichord and its different cousins, the virginal, the clavichord, those are all similar instruments. But the public was really fascinated with these, these displays of uh, flashy keyboard music. Um, so the piano was invented. It's supposedly invented around 1700. We, we don't know exactly the, um, the exact date, but it was invented in Italy um, by Cristofori, um, Bartolomeo Cristofori. Uh, when the piano was first invented, it was actually extreme, it was very similar to the harpsichord. It had only those five octaves. It was made of wood, um, same types of strings. The, the main difference is that instead of plucking the string when the key is pressed down, there is a hammer that hits the string. So if you push the key down softly, the hammer will hit, its, hit the string slower. So then the sound is softer. Um, so the, the piano, I don't know if anybody knows their terminology, but piano in the context of music, when we see it on our page, piano, it means soft, right? And 
when we see the term forte, it means loud. And that was actually the original name for the piano was the forte piano, which is not very creative. <laughs> in my opinion, the Italians, they said, hey, this instrument plays soft and loud. Let's call it the soft loud, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, but yes, so the, the primary difference is that hammer. And on the bottom left side of your screen, you can see a very complicated contraption mechanism that has the key on the right hand side. And then on the left is the hammer and the string. This particular one is standard. This is called the action of the piano, which is um, the mechanism on the inside that that does the actual music making. Um, this one's called a double escapement, which means that when the hammer hits, it actually comes back down. Um, so you can repeat notes on the piano really fast because the hammer can go up and down really fast. Um, so that was a very late invention. Um, yeah, so, sorry, let me find, oh yes, the second most important difference between the piano and the harpsichord is the pedals. Um, so on the piano, we have three pedals. You can't see them on mine, but I have them up here. Um, the right pedal, all the way to the right, is called the damper pedal. And so on the picture on the right side, right hand side of the whole inside of the piano, you see these black things that are kind of closer to the um, keys themselves. And you can kind of see on my instrument, um, if you can, they're right here. And those are the dampers. And the damper basically goes down onto the key, uh, onto the string after it's hit so that it doesn't just ring out forever, which is what happened on the harpsichord. When you press the key, the sound will just ring out until you lift the key again. Um, with the piano, as soon as I push, put the key back up, the damper goes back down and the string is muted. So the pedal, the damper pedal, it actually lifts all of these dampers up. So all the strings are able to vibrate. So when I play something on the instrument and I push down that right pedal and I can do it, all the sound is, it stays the whole time. This is a super important invention and we're gonna go through some repertoire uh, on some piano repertoire and talk about sort of how this invention changed how composers were writing. Um, on the left side, there's something called a soft pedal. Uh, the soft pedal is similar to the two manuals of the harpsichord, where one manual only hits one string, the bottom manual hits multiple strings. Um, there are multiple strings for each note. So when I push a key, I'm actually hitting three strings, two or three strings. And so when you push the soft pedal, it moves the hammer over a little bit so that it only hits one string. And the, the proper term for the soft pedal is the una corda, which means one string. Um, and so that's where that comes from. The middle pedal is the most uh, confusing of them all. <laughs> the middle pedal has many, many, many functions um, depending on what instrument you come across. So there are some upright pianos where if you push the middle pedal, it'll put down a piece of felt so that this, the whole piano is a lot softer. Um, and there, there's just so many different things that that middle pedal could do. Sometimes it'll be, um, only to soften the bottom or only soften the top. The most common and the, the one that is pretty standard on all concert instruments, including this one, is when you push the middle pedal, um, that one damper, so you remember the dampers, when I push this, the damper pedal, they all lift up. This sostenuto pedal will lift up only one damper. So I can hold a note forever and ever. <laughs> and then play short notes while this low one is still holding. So lots of fancy things as the piano's, piano developed that, uh, that have uh, been taken advantage of by composers for, for several years. One thing that I would love to mention, I might turn my camera a little bit. 
so that you can see. And I'll make this smaller. So inside of the piano, you can see there's this giant frame. Uh, and so this was invented in the 19th century. This iron frame uh, is necessary because there are so many strings in the piano now since it's been developed. Uh, there's over 200 of them. And each one of those strings is pulled to a pressure that's equal to nearly 100 pounds. So if you think of, if you're a math person, if you're thinking about the math of that, <laughs> that's 200 plus strings all at 100 pounds or so. Um, that's over 20 tons of pressure just inside of this, um, this piano case. So the iron frame, which was invented in the 1800s during the Industrial Revolution, can actually hold all those strings together um, without things snapping. And there's lots of famous uh, stories about Beethoven in his older piano that didn't have the iron frame constantly snapping strings because the frame just like just could not keep up with him. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that they invented the iron one. Only a few snap strings, <laughs> um, not definitely not as many as Beethoven for me. Um, another notable thing is you can see on the, the bottom right hand side that, and I mentioned before, the piano spans a larger amount of keys. It's nearly eight octaves. There's actually one piano, um, the, I think it's called the Imperial by Boisendorfer, who's a piano maker, um, which adds, I think it's 10 extra keys at the bottom. Uh, so it's very deep and really interesting to play on those piano. I got I had a chance to play on one of them uh, one time but didn't use any of the notes so the new the, the extra notes I should have done that <laughs> okay so for our piano uh, talk as we're going through a few pieces um, I'd like to kind of point out the the differences between the music and the type of instrument that each composer might have been playing. Um, so Mozart was really the first to use a piano, um, to really have grown up and used and written for an actual piano. Um, so his his music, and we're gonna I'm gonna play a little bit of his sonata in C major, would have been on that small five octave piano. That's mostly wood and a lot softer. So here's a little bit of Mozart's Sonata in C major. So Mozart in the 1700s was writing music like that. By the time Beethoven came on the scene, the piano had grown a bit larger. Uh, there, was a, there was a damper pedal, a sustain pedal, which is the one that holds all the notes. So we get some music like this one. Hey, Tim. Yes. Will you turn original sound on real quick? Yes. That one was just a little, a little bit. bit. It was OK, it was okay though. though. Okay. by Beethoven, the Moonlight Sonata, I'm sure many people are familiar with. He actually indicates for us to hold down the sustain pedal for the entire piece. <laughs> um, so most people don't do that, but it shows that Beethoven is, is taking advantage of these innovations that are being made by the instrument, especially the pedals and the sustain pedal. As we move forward in time, we have uh, Friedrich Chopin, uh, who was one of the many virtuosos of the 19th century. 
his piano um, was similar to the one that we have now, not quite, but it had the iron frame, um, it had steel strings, so no longer the old fashioned strings. Um, but most importantly, that sustain uh, quality is what's being used more and more. Um, so here's an excerpt from his Nocturne. So like Chopin, there was Liszt, and Liszt was probably the most famous of all the, the pianists. Um, and he was the one who really started taking advantage of the piano as a solo instrument. Um, and so we talked about the harpsichord and how it was always positioned facing the orchestra so that the harpsichordists could conduct. So Liszt was well known as a very handsome person. <laughs> and so when he was uh, giving his piano concerts, he was the first to actually turn the piano so that on the stage you could see his beautiful profile. <laughs> and it stuck. So now everyone does that. And that's pretty much a regular practice. Um, but Liszt was very famous for basically pushing the bounds of what the piano could do. Um, and all of these composers were working very closely with uh, piano makers. And that's why we have so many different types of pianos because each composer would say, oh, I need more bass. I need, I need more sustain up here, or I want a pedal that can ring a bell like Mozart's. Um, and the piano makers would deliver on those things. So that is why we have just a massive amount of different types of keyboard instruments. So here's an excerpt from Liszt's uh, Liebestrom. So by the time um, Liszt was in his um, aging years, so this was late in the 18th century, uh, sorry, late in the 1800s, um, we kind of sort of start to arrive at the modern piano. Uh, and the person who really took advantage, I think, of that big sound that we get out of the piano um, was Debussy. So Debussy, um, he was fascinated with this idea of um, being able to hold multiple notes at the same time, like we talked about when we pushed the damper pedal. And so all of his music has that sort of uh, atmospheric quality where everything is just floating in the air and so beautiful. So here's a little bit of um, Debussy's Claire de Lune. So I asked a question a while back, <laughs> which was, why do we think that the piano isn't an orchestral instrument very often? And I wonder, does anyone have any immediate thoughts based on what we were just talking about? Might switch your chair. Oh. <laughs> yeah, feel free to unmute if you like, guys, and answer his question. So any thoughts about why the piano might not be considered a or not regularly featured as an orchestral instrument. Because it plays a whole orchestra of notes on its own. That's, that's great. And I think, I think that's right in line with um, what I was thinking as well. And especially because we have these 
these virtuosic composers who are working with piano makers to make an instrument that can basically stand on its own, right? Um, so just like you said, with the orchestral sounds all being in one giant music box. Um, so when you hear orchestral music that features keyboard instruments, um, it's very rare that you'll have a piano in the classical repertoire. What's really great about the Terre Haute Symphony is that we play a lot of different styles of music. So I actually get to play with the orchestra a bunch because we play a lot of popular style music, um, which features the piano a lot more readily than classical music. So before we wrap up, there's one more keyboard instrument that I have not mentioned yet. And this is the one that you most likely have heard in an orchestral setting. So the celeste. The celeste is again, a keyboard instrument. You can see the key. It has hammers, so it's very similar to the piano, except the hammers hit little metal bars, kind of like a percussion instrument. Um, so this is the type of instrument that we call an idiophone because the actual instrument itself is making the sound, like the, something is vibrating um, to make the sound without the use of strings or air or anything else. The celeste, the word, or celesta, sometimes we call, um, means heavenly because the sound is so heavenly. <laughs> and the most famous piece I will play for you now that I'm sure everyone has heard before at Christmas time <laughs> features the celeste very prominently. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure we've all heard that before. Uh, that very beautiful bell-like sound um, comes, from a comes from the celeste. And a lot of times as an uh, orchestral pianist, I will be tasked with having to play one part on the piano and then switch really quickly over to the celeste that's sitting right next to me. Um, and it's a little bit jarring because the celeste is so small, the keyboard is very small. Um, and everything is an octave higher. So if I'm reading my music, uh, I have to play an octave lower than I am actually reading, which is a little bit confusing um, when we get to that instrument. Before I leave you all, or before we ask questions, I'd love to answer some questions. Um, I'm going to play a little bit of uh, a piece by George Gershwin, The Three Preludes. So Gershwin, um, this is sort of a shout out to our upcoming, all, um, upcoming Hats Off to Broadway concert. Uh, Gershwin was much later in the 20th century. Uh, he was heavily influenced by jazz, which I am as well. So I love playing his music. Um, and he really took advantage of this this full key, he was blessed to be able to access this fully formed uh, concert piano that we know today. So here's a little bit of uh, Gershwin's, the first prelude of Gershwin. Did you turn original sound on? Okay, thanks. Thank you. 
That was, that great. was great. Thank you. Tim. All right. So Tim will be playing that on the uh, Symphony League's fundraiser called Hats Off to Broadway, which premieres this Friday at 7.30. Um, if you guys don't have tickets to that event, I highly recommend getting tickets. It also features Caroline Goodwin, who is a Terre Haute native. Uh, she went to Vigo County North, um, and it's a fabulous concert. I'm really excited. Um, so Tim will play all three Gershwin preludes for that concert on Friday. So, well, excellent. Thank you so much, Tim. There were definitely things I did not know about the piano or any of the, uh, some of the other keyboards. Um, so I would like to open it up for questions. I'm going to read through the questions that have been submitted on the chat first. Um, and then uh, if anyone has questions after that, um, I'll allow you to unmute your mics or if Michelle, someone in person has a question, we'll also do that. Um, Carl Bender asked, um, why the blonde or white piano? He noticed that your piano is not black. Yeah, so that is uh, purely an aesthetic choice by the, <laughs> by the person who made the piano. There's not a uh, definitive difference between the standard matte black instrument that a lot of the Steinways have. Um, and then this white blonde piano, this is actually not my piano. Um, my piano is mahogany wood. Um, so it comes in all kinds of different uh, colors and shapes. I went to a museum once and played a green piano that had orange keys. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty bizarre what people come up with. Um, but standard wise um, for concerts on a concert stage, black has become sort of the the one you always see yeah or crisp white sometimes like a bright white and you'll see in a lot of jazz type situations sometimes so is your piano at the shop uh, my piano is not I didn't I don't have my piano here in Indiana my parents have my piano <laughs> Florida yeah 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 yeah. So you're just renting this one or how does that work? Um, this one's actually uh, my roommate's piano. So. Okay, got it, got yeah. it, okay. Not fine. All right, um, Betsy Frank asks, how much does your piano cost? Um, and then do you have any other keyboard instruments? And you might kind of give a gist of how much pianos cost in general and what's the range? Yeah, so this is a fun, this is an interesting conversation because a lot of my students uh, will ask the same things about what pianos should I buy and uh, what's a good quality piano. So it has a lot to do with brand. Um, and so this is a Kawai piano. So that's uh, made in Japan, I think. And it um, is one of the standards. The Steinway and Sons, of course, is probably the most well-known. Uh, and then there's some European Boisendorfer, Fazioli, um, and Yamaha, I think is probably the other most well-known piano maker. As far as cost is concerned, it has a lot to do with um, the size of the instrument. So this is a six foot long piano. The pianos in concert halls are um, about nine feet or more long. And so those range, uh, those will get in the upper 200,000s about. Um, and below that, it is an enormous range and really hard to say, um, you know, what is standard because there's, there's so, uh, there's a lot of newer piano makers that are going for the aesthetic look. <laughs> and so you can charge a lot of money when you have a nice uh, furniture-esque sort of instrument. But as far as quality of instrument goes, if you're looking for a professional grade um, piano, either for home or for the concert hall, uh, you're looking at many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, like a car. House. Buying a car or house, yeah. 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 <laughs> yep. Oh, and sorry, I didn't answer the other question. I, I have a few electric keyboards and a synthesizer. I don't have any of, I don't have a harpsichord or any of those things at home, um, but that would be something I wish I had, <laughs> but very expensive as well. Yeah, and Carl just wrote um, the piano in Columbus. Uh, I forget what the brand is. I think it was over $200. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it again? Shigeru Kawai. 
Yeah, yep. So that's the piano um, that was gifted to the Columbus, Indiana Philharmonic. And I think they said it was about $200,000. Yep. Yep. Um, now you've played on that piano. Do you notice a difference when you play on a $200,000 piano versus your $25,000 piano? Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> The quality of the instrument is massively improved and there's a lot of subtleties. Um, so there are people who are experts in this, piano technicians, um, who can talk about all of the resonant qualities of the instrument and the why it sounds like this and not. And for me, I, I go in and I play and I say, no, I don't like that. <laughs> yes, I like that. <laughs> um, and when it's these really uh, expensive instruments. There's not a lot to want from those. They they have every possible sound you could want. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Betsy Frank noted when we were, we were talking about the organs at the Washington National Cathedral has a fabulous organ. Um, now, as a pianist, how much studying of the organ do you do? That's a voluntary. I, I've taken... Um, a couple of years of organ lessons for practical reasons. Um, you know, a lot of freelance life involves church music and I was very active in, um, as a staff pianist at my church. And so taking the organ just was, a, it made sense. I didn't, I don't know nearly uh, as much about organ as I do the piano, but, right. uh, or, or have the skills. I'm still not great with my feet with all the... <laughs> Well, I think a lot of people don't realize that, uh, at least at IU, majoring in organ and majoring in piano, two completely different degrees. Um, you focus on one. Um, harpsichord is typically um, with early music. Um, I don't, they don't have a degree just in harpsichord, do they? Or is it just like a, they do? It's forte piano and harpsichord. So okay. the, original, the original piano which is very similar to the harpsichord. Right, okay, yeah, yep. So it's it's interesting, even though they're all grouped together. I mean, I guess it's kind of like woodwinds. Mm -hmm. They're still separate degrees of study when you get to a certain level, yeah. Um, what type of material was used um, early on for the strings before they were steel? Yeah, it's similar to um, to string instruments. So I'm, I'm sure someone has talked about the string instruments. All yes. Right, right? Yeah. Philip, that, yeah, typically um, yeah. is uh, the the historical instruments all use gut strings. So um, I don't know exactly the chemical makeup and how that all works, uh, but it was it was not metal. It's something to do with animals. <laughs> Organic material typically yeah. from the gut of an animal. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of Gershwin, why do we rarely hear his? You talking about the second piano concerto? Carl, um, that's a good question. <laughs> no, I'm familiar with his no, first. The, the second, the second rhapsody. The oh. second rhapsody. Oh, okay. um, yes. Yeah. I've I've heard it a few times. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, do. I don't know if um, it's hard to say what is mainstream in in repertoire mm -hmm. anymore um, because we're branching in a good way. We're branching out a lot. Um, I think for Gershwin, there's the the concerto and then Rhapsody in Blue. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do, at least as a concert or a touring artist, you have to think about what is going to engage, um, you know, especially working with uh, community orchestras or uh, orchestras that are hoping to, to access that community. Um, they are programming things that are popular so that people will enjoy them. And so Rhapsody in Blue certainly is popular. Uh, and the concerto maybe less so, but it's very active and interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think probably the decision is made, you know, if you're going to choose Rhapsody in Blue or the second Rhapsody, you're probably going to choose Rhapsody in Blue. <laughs> Go for two. Go for two. I mean, does the second Rhapsody open with a clarinet solo, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we need to give Sam and her uh, her time to shine, right? <laughs> All right, uh, we are at the end of our list here. So, Michelle, does anyone in person have any questions? Uh, 
I think Michelle's gone to sleep. <laughs> uh, we're here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello. Good. Yes. Um, I'm wondering about the history of those compact vertical pianos you see in homes or the strings like must be vertical. The upright. Uh, where, the upright, yeah. Where, where did that come from? Um, so that that was, that had always existed. Um, so when back in the harpsichord days, pre-piano, um, there were basically at-home harpsichords that were strung. Uh, so right now we're looking at a piano where the, the strings and the wood piece behind them is horizontal, um, but they would basically flip this whole thing upwards. Uh, and it doesn't change a whole lot uh, as far as mechanics of the instrument. It feels a lot different, um, but mechanics wise, it's pretty much the same. The pre-piano version of this upright piano um, was the clavichord, which was square mm, okay. just like the ones that I think we're talking about. Um, and so when piano makers were building, especially in the 19th century, they there was a lot of public interest in Europe in the piano because it was new and it was exciting. And that was the main form of entertainment besides opera. Um, so people wanted pianos in their homes. So the piano makers were building those square instruments for the home. Uh, home playing. And, and it was, it, there's a whole fascinating thing about um, the relationship between the composer and the piano maker, as well as the publishers of music. Um, so composers would work with a piano manufacturer who's coming out with a new uh, square piano and publish music with this publisher to try to get people to buy that music they just heard in their concert to play at home on their new square piano. So it's like a whole symbiotic relationship that's really interesting. Um, but I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, we have another question, just a second. Okay, well, I have a question. So how long have you been playing the piano? Because it seems like you're not all that old. So did you start when you were like one? <laughs> no, I actually was a late bloomer. Um, so I started when I was eight, I think. So that's very- wow. Wow. Young compared to many others. So most of my colleagues started when they were four. Um, and I think I heard Philip mention this about um, the piano. You can start that a lot younger than a lot of other instruments um, and especially voice. And I don't know how it is with clarinet, but. Um, yeah, well, most of the winds in general, you start when you're 10, 11, 12, when you're in elementary school, late elementary school. Right. So. Um, with the piano, I mean, all the keys are here. You just are teaching, especially young kids, uh, how to <laughs> move their fingers and the notes are already there. Um, so a lot of people will start uh, start very, very young. I mean, for my youngest student is five. <laughs> um, okay, so then that leads into my next question because you always hear people talk about, oh, they've got such long fingers they could play the piano. So a four-year-old does not have long fingers. How does a four-year-old play the piano? Yeah, well, that's the, that's the, if you have a good teacher, they, <laughs> they can. Good answer. Pick repertoire and pick techniques to learn that don't require that until um, there's so much to learn besides just reaching big chords and lots of my friends, uh, lots of my colleagues have small hands, pianists that have small hands, so they make it work. <laughs> I have a pretty big hand, so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Is it Rachmaninoff that has the span of like a 10th or who's the composer? Yeah, that Rachmaninoff, I think it was a 12th. Yeah, it's yeah. like ridiculously big hands and- You write all of his music, you can, if you look, it's just no, 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 no. It's like this long <laughs> on the page. Wow. Okay. So what's probably the most biggest misconception that you can think of that people have about, about the piano is, you know, that, I mean, because it, it's so popular and it was definitely something that was in so many homes, especially, you know, turn of the, the 20th century, because that was their entertainment, as you said, at home. So, you know, what, what's the biggest misconception you can think of? Well, currently, the biggest misconception that I uh, come across, which is sort of why I structure my presentation the way I did, is that um, a lot of people don't understand that 
the keys are levers. So they operate something. And so that means that when you push the key, there's, there's some pressure and there's some, you can uh, feel the mechanism working in the piano. So now the most popular instrument um, besides guitar is the electric keyboard. And so a lot, a lot, a lot of people will purchase electric keyboards, um, which is fine. I have an electric keyboard. I'm not saying anything against that, um, but it's really hard to um, communicate that if you're taking the piano seriously and you want to grow, um, the, the, the keyboard is, is, has a very, it has a limit um, because the piano really is so different even though they look, I know they look the same <laughs> and this part is the same, but everything over here is completely different. Um, so it affects how you learn. Often electric keyboards, um, like when I was a kid, I had an electric keyboard, but the keys were not weighted. They were very light, very easy to push down. Right. And the first time I ever sat down at a real piano, I was like, oh my gosh, the keys are so heavy. Yep. And that's when, you know, the parents realize we need to get a keyboard with weighted keys to at least yep. make it somewhat feel like a real piano. Because um, like Tim said, if you're going to take it seriously, you have got to get used to the weight and the feel and the mechanism of a real piano. Yep, definitely. <laughs> that's a good question, Michelle. Thank you for that. Uh well, one of the, the people here said it would be kind of like the idea of, you know, typing on an old fashioned typewriter as compared to my laptop keyboard. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got to really push with those fingers on that old fashioned typewriter. So, yeah, yeah. that that's good comparison. Out 60 words a minute on an old fashioned typewriter. <laughs> yeah. Now, th this has been a question that's been asked, so nobody's asked it. So I'm going to. So many other musicians that we've necessarily seen come from the orchestra talk about, okay, what, what do I do? To, because for you, your hands are the most important part to play your instrument. So do you do specific exercises? Do you have big issues? Do you have injuries that come from, um, yes. yeah, from playing? Sure. Um, so I think most common among pianists, uh, which seems very obvious, is carpal tunnel um, because you're moving your fingers a lot. So if you have tension while you're playing, uh, that sort of builds up. And I I had at one point a, a little bit of injury, but it was nothing serious, like several, uh, the, uh, the probably the most famous pianist now, Long Long. He uh, just recovered, I think a year ago from an extended, uh, he had to have surgery and everything else. So that's that's probably the most common. Um, posture is extremely important, <laughs> like every instrument. Um, we don't have backs to our benches, right? So we can't, we have to sit upright and playing the instrument properly involves the entire arm and back. So there's a lot of back injury issues as well. Um, the, there's another famous pianist, Martha Argerich, and she, uh, had to have surgery for something, it was unrelated. And they were going to take out some of her muscle here to, I think, replace somewhere else. And she said, she can't, you can't do that because I need this muscle to play the piano. Um, so we have to be really aware. I've taken um, several years of Alexander technique. Um, yeah, but Joyce Wilson talked about that last week, yes. Um, to try to help with that and occasional massage therapy. That's just for me though. <laughs> um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, absolutely. Tim, which pianist? I think it's Schumann who tried, who had that contraption. Oh, yeah. Can we talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, so I forgot. So there's a belief in finger stretching. Uh, it's not something I've been overly convinced by that it makes that much of a difference. Um, but there, uh, there's a famous story of Schumann, who's the first composer I played today. Um, at the end of his life, or towards the end of his life, uh, actually, no, 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 this was at the beginning. He was a concert pianist, but he wasn't as good as his colleagues. And so he thought, if I could 
just have a longer, a wider span. So he invented this contraption that he put his hand in and it basically oh. stretched out the, the fingers and to the point where he did something to one of his tendons and then he could never play again. So, <laughs> and that was very early actually in his career. Right. Uh, yeah. So Schumann wasn't really a, a pianist in the same way that Liszt or Chopin was, where they were- That's why he married one. That's exactly, that's why Clara could play he, piano. <laughs> yeah, he lived vicariously <laughs> through her. <laughs> okay, here's another question. Yeah. Uh, it's more of a comment. Another thing that can contribute to carpal tunnel syndrome for pianists is something called static positioning. You're kind of locked in position for a long, long time, only one tiny little body part moving. So, mm. Right. And I think that that's, hopefully that doesn't happen too often. If you have, pro like, if you've thought about these things and are, are uh, developing a technique that prevents that, there should always be movement almost everywhere at all times. Um, not like <laughs> movement like this, but at least nothing locked, like you were saying. Okay, so then that, that leads to my next silly question is, you okay. always see the concert pianists walk in, you know, and they flap their tails out when they're going to sit down, right? And mm -hmm. what then, what do they do next? They pop their fingers, or at least it looks like it. And I right. can't imagine that you guys pop your fingers because that would be bad. I so do. Is, is that an actual I thing? Don't... I think that's a, I, is, I don't think that's true. I think you clap, cracking your finger. I know my mom always told me that it was bad, um, but I looked this up extensively and couldn't find any evidence that it actually was. Okay, so do you pop your fingers? Is, is that a normal thing for a, you know, a concert pianist to do? I pop do your pop fingers before you start to play. Ah! <laughs> but in general, yes, I pop my fingers. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, then That's you're gonna, you're going to be the person who proves that it's not a bad thing after all. I don't know. I hope it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Oh, Gracie has another question. Just a second. Sure. Um, this is a little bit different type of question, but uh, when the orchestra is together and they're playing and it's so emotional and technical and all the things that you can think of it's very synchronistic and everything and when they get through playing is the emotion so high that sometimes that sparks a little romance in the members Do you have any members that well, yeah that? <laughs> thank you i mean we have oh. um, not just in Terre Haute. I, I mean i'm not actually aware of anybody in Terre Haute, but just throughout my Call my career, yes, musicians typically are attracted to other musicians. <laughs> well, I think too, there's something about that music making together that is yeah. special and un, there's like an unspoken specialness about it. Um, but also it takes a lot of work. So when you're playing with other people, there's a lot of communication that's not verbal. Um, and it takes a lot of work to get to that place. So I think I think, yeah, it makes sense that there's some uh, romance that <laughs> sneaks its way. Well, we, we got Dan and Martha, and years ago, there were two bassoonists who were married. And they moved out west someplace to join a different faculty. I can't recall their names, but yeah, there, there's a little romance in the orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Believe it. Uh, speaking of that, there were two French horn players, Nancy and Dave Watkins. Yes. Um, yes. Who, yeah, Nancy is sitting yes. right next to me in our office in here. <laughs> How often do you practice a day? Yes. So um, lots of famous pianists throughout time have suggested many different things <laughs> so um, then so, how, how long do you practice a day yeah no, I so when I'm playing actively so that means pre-COVID I was practicing six to seven hours a day um, oh. currently and for the past year I've sort of switched uh, or not switched but I've been more active in my teaching than I have performing, which sort of makes sense because there's not a lot of performing opportunities right now. Um, so I've, I try to practice at least two hours a day. Um, that's just for upcoming projects and to keep my fingers active. 
Uh, but I will freely admit it doesn't always happen because <laughs> it's quite busy somehow. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, so then that's just sparked, I swear, my last question. Probably. Because it makes me think of you guys as athletes. I am, have absolutely no musical ability in any way, shape, or form, and I, I can't even think of how to make music. But there's there's so much control muscle wise or breath wise for all the instruments that when you know you kind of go out of going from six hours a day practicing to you know maybe every other day practicing two or three hours when you get back into you know like performance season hopefully like this fall um well you almost have to go back in training in order to get your body and everything up and running ah see i thought that was true Absolutely. I mean, um, so my last performance was in Columbus uh, Memorial Day weekend, and I decided to take a break from the clarinet. So I haven't played for about two weeks and I'll go pick up my instrument again this weekend and I will feel it. This will be out of shape and I will return to some scales and some patterns to get this back in shape. It'll take about an hour for me to get my muscles back wow. to where they need to be. And then it'll take another week and a half to two weeks to build up my endurance again. So typically wow. before a concert, I'm, I'm starting to get in shape about two weeks before the concert to make sure that I can make it through the entire concert as a wind player. Yeah, for me, um, for me, it's the performance side of things. So uh, if I'm regularly performing and practicing six, seven hours a day, um, then my mind is always actively thinking about all these mechanics and all of this. Um, and so when I am out of that and I'm experiencing this now where the last year has been sort of a down, <laughs> a down practice right. time for me, that when I come back and do performances, I'm not as, um, I guess, bulletproof as I was before uh and yeah that's it's not as technical I don't think for me um as with Sammy like there's nothing lost as far as I'm um, sure or anything um right. but maybe endurance would be one where I could play for seven hours before when I was doing it all the time but if I were to try to play for seven hours now I don't think so <laughs> <laughs> Players All right. Cannot play that long. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, that's anybody else have any other questions in here? Okay. Anybody out on Zoom have any other questions before we kind of turn this over? I know Sammy was going to talk a little bit about the, the upcoming um, fundraiser for the symphony. So um, if there's no other questions, I'll turn that over to you, Sammy. Great, thanks. Well, as we mentioned before, um, Tim is gonna be joining us for our uh, Symphony League Hats Off to Broadway fundraiser that happens this Friday at 7.30. It is a virtual fundraiser. So um, the concert was pre-recorded and we will stream it online um, at 7.30 on Friday. Um, and it will also include a silent auction the silent auction has many uh, really cool items in there, including two THSO experiences. Um, there's a um, gift card to Stables, Bar Bosco, there's a wine basket, there's um, THSO logo wear, wine tumblers, there's all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, so if you don't have your tickets yet, you can go online to THSO.org and um, scroll down just a little bit on the screen and you'll see Hats Off to Broadway and buy tickets. Um, they're only $15 and um, it's going to the Symphony League so that they can sponsor a concert during our 21-22 season, which is excellent. And we're so excited and so glad to have of the Symphony League, um, part of our organization. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to um, uh, about our upcoming tour of the orchestra presentations next season. So um, after July 1st, we're going to shift how we do these slightly. Um, we're not going to just focus on an instrument necessarily. Um, we're going to start incorporating topics of history, music theory, uh, composer information, or information about pieces that are upcoming on our, um, our season next year. So on um, July 13th, we're going to welcome our principal trumpet, Jay Ellsmore, back um, for an Ollie presentation. And he's going to talk about 
about um, the trumpet concertos. Um, typically, the most famous trumpet concertos are by Haydn and Hummel. And he's going to talk a little bit about pieces by Shostakovich and um, John Williams, Tomasi, Bach, all of these different composers that really took the trumpet concerto and made it their own. Then on August 13th, which is a Friday, uh, we're going to welcome back our THSO English horn, Dr. Jennifer Kirby, and she's going to talk about ancient out. music. Oops, Siri thinks I was talking to her. Um, she's going to talk about ancient music and its development um, from uh, Mesopotamia, Syria, Egypt, Greece, and, and how it um, developed. Um, she um, friends with her on Facebook, and she said just since she has started reading articles, they've discovered a new ancient instrument, and she's kind of gone down a rabbit hole of all these really in interesting facts um, and instruments from the ancient period. So that one should be really, really good. And then uh, as we get into September, um, we'll return to our two presentations a month in September and November and October. Um, and then I think we'll just do one presentation in December. Um, yeah. Michelle, anything else I need to share? Uh, those presentations in July, I just want to make sure that everybody, because I know that the second that the program guide goes out, and I've probably had four phone calls this morning of when is the program guide coming out, Michelle, just as fast as Michelle can create it. It will be out this week, I swear. It, even if there's blank spots, it will be out this week. Um, but when you get that, Sammy has um, actually been able to find a grant that kind of helps sponsor um, the musicians. So basically Good. that means that basically starting in July, moving forward, there will be no fee attached to any of the stuff that we're doing with the symphony, which is great. Um, yeah. it, it's that great for the isn't. musicians. It's great for everybody. You will yeah. still need to register. It will not be listed under a special event or special tour in any way, shape, or form. It's now going to be listed under other presentations, at least for July and August. So when you get the program guide, don't call me and say, Michelle, it's not in here. Yes, it is. Go farther back. Um, then when you basically get into the fall semester, again, you're going to find we're actually going to be doing, I think we've decided one a month at Westminster Village. So our standing yes. Wednesday presentation will have something to do with the symphony, either, you know, kind of highlighting whatever the, the upcoming concert's going to be um, or something along those lines. And then the other presentation will literally be listed under other presentation. So you'll find those things with the symphony for the fall in two different locations. But again, it's, it's, fantastic that we're going to be able to do this um, completely and totally free of charge. Again, you'll need to register for all of that, but um, just kind of keep that in mind. So any any questions for me or any questions for Sammy about the, the upcoming schedule? Evidently not. Okay. Right. Um, Tim, I cannot thank you enough. That was a fantastic presentation. I, I learned way more about um, the keyboard than I ever even honestly never even thought that much about the keyboard and so now I have to go back and go down the rabbit hole like um, Sam was talking about so I can get a little bit more information so thank you so much it was fantastic and again Sammy thank you so much for for making all this happen absolutely it's great to see everybody have a good rest of your week thank you everyone thank you Bye.